Welcome back everyone. In this lecture we're going to take our first glimpse at the history of corrections. And in this one we're going to go way back. We're going to talk about pre-Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, and sort of the era of enlightenment. Um, all uh, time periods well before even the creation of the United States of America. Um, and it, obviously we could probably spend an entire semester just talking about the history of corrections from various parts of the world. But our focus in this one is to try to have a streamlined approach to look at some of the um, ways in which societies responded to law violators and handled the punishment of individuals that sort of fed into what we currently see in the United States. Um, so in this lecture we're going to talk, we're going to start off looking at some of the predecessors to Western law and punishment. We're then going to do dabble in a little bit of European history and then we'll wrap up with sort of talking about some of the major um, influencers in during the period of enlightenment and the age of reason. Uh, the chapters for your reading that correspond with this lecture are chapters two and three from your textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. So when we look back to pivotal examples of how societies around the world have responded to punishment um, throughout you know, humankind's history, several sort of pop up as being some of the, the major ones. Going back to the Sumerian law of Mesopotamia um, around you know, 3000 BC, the Code of Hammurabi, uh, the Draconian Code of Greece, the Roman Law of the Twelve Tables. Now, each one of these were um, sort of pivotal and, and, influ and influential in the sense that in major sort of um, societies of the time, they were some of the earliest forms in which laws and punishment and social behavior were sort of codified. Um, and that means written down and recorded so that it was sort of spread amongst that entire civilization. Civilization. Now, a look through those without going into great detail about each one is we want to take out what were some of the common themes that we can take away from these, these ancient examples. And one of the key things that still sort of holds on to today is the idea of matching a specific type of offense with an appropriate punishment. And as you'll see, this kind of, you know, comes and goes throughout time, but there's always a return to this sort of, you know, rational ideal. Um, sometimes throughout di different civilizations, different time periods, sometimes there'll be a push for harsher punishment or more lenient punishment. But one of the common cores is often matching the severity of an offense with a particular punishment. Now, that sounds pretty modern, but when we look through these examples, um, the rest of the common themes that we see tend to be things that we think of being a little bit antiquated. Um, there was a definitely a push in many of these examples that are listed there of sort of like slow pain and torture. Um, stoning was a common sort of punishment that was included in these. If you're not familiar with stoning, it's basically, imagine getting hit in the head with a bunch of rocks, right? Whether they're being thrown by one person or everyone in, in town gets a chance to pick up a rock and throw it at you. Um, you can imagine sort of the, not exactly the most um, relaxing form of punishment. So stoning, other slow public deaths, um, people being displayed in the public areas, you know, things of that nature, um, being, you know, not able to have access to food or water, um, being sort of strung up in various ways. These were sort of common amongst these things. Another sort of common theme that we see in a lot of these ancient examples tends to be sort of the a, a form of punishment putting by putting individuals into slavery. Um, so they, they are basically owned by other individuals. Um, when civilizations were in an area where they could basically just cast people away from the civilized the civilization center um, we see exile um, basically forcing people to leave if they can't follow the rules overall a bunch of really tough punishments and things that in in our modern eyes may look a little bit severe So when we look at what led to, you know, the biggest influences that would later influence the United States and America, um, probably our be best place to look is at European history. Um, we drew, we have drawn a lot of our correctional practices and punishment approaches from directly from Western Europe. Um, so prior to the Middle Ages in Europe, responses to crime were seen as primarily a private affair. 
Um, and there's a Latin term, lex talionis, which um, stands for sort of like the idea of law of retaliation or an eye for an eye. And it was sort of seen when you didn't have sort of like centralized societies, centralized civilizations, and you had sort of like small outcroppings of villages and people living throughout various hillsides and areas throughout Western Europe, it was sort of the, the mindset that each individual, especially if you were a property owner or if you owned goods or if you owned cattle or sheep or chickens or whatever it may be, that it was your responsibility to take care of yourself. And there wasn't sort of a centralized law enforcement system that was there to, you know, that you could call 911 if you needed help. Um, those things slowly started to change as we moved into the Middle Ages. So as we start to get to, you know, 12, 1300 AD, we saw the growth of secular law. And secular law, in a simplest sense, without going into a lot of detail, is sort of the belief that there's a sense of a law of society. So rather than having our guiding principles about what is good and bad, what, it, what should be a sin, what should be allowed um, in, in accordance with sort of church law, Secular law says, well, let's back up a little bit and not think about religion because we may not always have agreement across religions, but rather if we want to build communities of human beings interacting together in one place, we need to find a way to maintain the peace. So this idea of social peace is sort of at the center of secular law. And that sort of started to grow through this time period of the Middle Ages in Western Europe. But we have to remember at the same point in time, the feudal system was in effect. And the feudal system, if you're not familiar with it, is simply the sense that you have landowners, um, you know, maybe they're aristocrats, maybe they um, have certain titles, a duke, duchess, whatever, and they may, lo they may own large swaths of land across like the English or, you know, French countryside or something along those ideas. And therefore, whatever, whoever happens to work on that land, the serfs, um, whoever happens to be, you know, a laborer on that land, um, then they're sort of under the rule of that that feudal lord um, so during this time period even though we're starting to see sort of the recognition of we need to have a balance of law and punishment to protect society when you have the feudal system you almost almost had like war between neighbors so when something when somebody overstepped or trespassed onto another landowner's land there was sort of a sense of well we're still going to use this lex talionis eye for an eye type approach and so because you had no real centralized government you often saw sort of war between neighbors pop up over minor um, offenses and minor issues um, but it was a step forward it was the idea that we need to start to think about how are we going to live in societies that over time are going to become increasingly more dense more populated um, and how do we get everyone to sort of buy into uh, the law or to, in order to um, exist with each other in a calm fashion. So what were some of the various approaches that we saw in Western Europe that sort of led to this sort of, um, you know, improvement or advancement in how we handled uh, punishment and the idea of corrections? So the next few slides, I'm sort of going to sort of highlight several of the mechanisms that sort of grew out of these time periods. And we often see these, especially this first one um, here in modern America, as well as around the world today. So one of the things that we saw in European history during this time period of, you know, post, you know, Middle Ages and a little bit um, more recent was a slow introduction of something called imprisonment. So prior to the 1500s, the idea of locking somebody up, taking them out of their home, taking them out of wherever they lived and worked, and actually, you know, confining them in a space was primarily used in a crude manner for pretrial detention. So across the European countryside, you'd have various areas. And if somebody had been accused of a crime, if somebody had been you know, you know, suspected to be guilty of a crime, they may be held mainly so that they wouldn't leave and flee. 
And so it was a very a crude form. And oftentimes the design and structure of whatever facility was used to hold somebody could have been a barn. It could have been um, a roughly fabricated stone building. Um, but there wasn't much forethought into it. Um, but in London in 1553, we see what was coined later as the first quote unquote house of correction. Um, and the way this came about was Bishop Nicholas Ridley convinced um, King Edward VI to donate Bridewell Palace. Now, Bridewell Palace, as you might imagine, across the English countryside, there were a lot of old you know, manors and castles and places. And Bridewell Palace had sort of fallen into dis, um, repair, was not being used in any sort of... Um, uh, purposeful manner at the time. And this bishop asked the king to sort of donate this house, this large manor, in order to house individuals who had been accused or convicted of crimes. Now, obviously, this wasn't some maximum security you know, facility. Rather, this was much more focusing on minor level criminals, prostitutes, um, poor vagrants, things of that nature. But the, the, the mindset which started to sort of sow the seeds of what we see, you you know, several hundred years later was this idea of punishment should be less about pure pain is what we saw a few slides ago. It shouldn't be about stoning. It shouldn't be about slavery or exile, but rather punishment should op often be an opportunity for correction. Um, so we sort of see a little bit of an idea of of the reformatory approach that we'll talk about later, or even a little bit of the rehabilitative approach that we'll talk about later. Um, and so what we see here, it was with Bridewell House was this idea of using one large facility in order to house multiple individuals, but also focusing on having these individuals do hard work um, to you know maintain the particular property and the manor, um, and also in an attempt to sort of teach them ways that would get them back on the, the, the appropriate track to be away from, from the criminal behavior that they, that they had been engaged in. Now, that doesn't mean just because we saw a glimpse during you know the 1500s of uh, an attempt at correction and rehabilitation and reformation and all these things, that doesn't mean that that was the only thing going on. Um, corporal punishment and death were still very popular and very common throughout um, England and Western Europe uh, during the 1500s to the 1700s. So one of the things here was is when individuals had engaged in serious acts of, of violence or crime, oftentimes the sense was we need to sort of send a message. Um, if you think back to one of our previous slides, one of the, the the biggest sort of rationales for punishment of the time was this idea of deterrence. Um, and deterrence, whether it be general deterrence or specific deterrence, was we need to punish individuals to send a message in, in order to stop criminal behavior from occurring again in the future. So since deterrence was such a popular approach, we saw a lot of public punishments with corporal punishments, with whippings, with floggings, with um, people being put in the stock in the town square, and then also very graphic forms of, of death um, being types of punishment that were still being used. And then another area of, or another philosophy as far as how they approach punishment was the growth of penal colonies. Now, looking back in today, when we're sitting here in the 21st century and we have, you know, quite a few billion people on the face of the earth, the idea of just throwing somebody into a boat or putting them in some sort of, you know, horse-drawn carriage and having them shipped off to some faraway place to just say, we don't want you here, we want you to go work or be punished or live somewhere far away is not, you know, is not something that is very, you know, um, easy to, to consider for us. However, when we think about this time period, especially during the 16 and 1700s, where you had a lot of powerful countries such as, you know, you had Spain, you had France, you had um, uh, Great Britain that controlled a lot, you know, as their maritime efforts allowed them to expand and seek out far reaches of the globe, they started to quote unquote colonize various um, places around the world. And one of the things that they found, found to be rather useful was, well, if we don't like certain a certain class of individuals or a criminal element within our society, let's just, as a punishment, ship them off to one of these colonies. And so the growth of penal colonies became rather popular in Western Europe. 
um, especially as they started to realize that their small quote unquote prisons um, or houses of corrections were quickly being crowded, right? It sounds easy to lock somebody up, but it takes up, each individual takes up space, and then you have to figure out a way to, rather than building more prisons, maybe let's just ship them off. And when we look at sort of, especially for um, Great Britain, sort of their push and use of penal colonies, from 1718 up to 1776, 50,000, give or take, British convicts were shipped to the American colonies. So, and especially if many of them landed in the shores of what is currently Georgia and Florida. Um, and we're out here and oftentimes they were shipped here simply to, with the sort of agreement that you will not return to England. Other times they were shipped over here as indentured servants where they would have to work almost in a slave type fashion for a certain number of years to work off their crimes. Um, and you'll notice the, the hopefully, Look, thinking back to your American history, you'll notice that the time period that I have listed goes up to 1776, right? Because we have the Declaration of Independence going into the American Revolution. So prior to the American Revolution, roughly 50,000 convicts were shipped here um, to become citizens, later citizens of America. And then once the um, American Revolution started to subside in the late, late, seven, or late 1780s, Britain now needed a new place to ship off their convicts to, since now America was its own independent country. So from 1787 to, eight, to the 1860s, so roughly 100 years, they just found a new place to ship their um, convicts to. So 160,000 prisoners were shipped to Tasmania, Australia, other places south of the equator, um, and pretty much in many you know ways sort of started to create new colonies and sort of a new civil civilization of former convicts and petty thieves and indentured servants um, started to populate many of these areas. And then we find a major shift. Um, the mid 1700s, we start to see an, a time period often referred to as the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. And what happened in the mid 1700s? Well, there was a lot of things going on in society. Um, one of the things that was going on, especially in various parts of, of Europe through England, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, was the rise of the merchant class. Um, as individuals, as society and, and, and human civilization and societies and cities and towns started to grow. So you had sort of these metropolitan, met, metropolitan centers where people came um, that brought in people from various countries, various areas, various parts around the, the surrounding countryside. And also with the, the rise in the navigation of the seas and maritime activity, we started to see that individuals and humans were starting to explore more and more around the world. And therefore, there was a sense of these individuals who weren't necessarily born into, uh, you know, um, the aristocracy or into, you know, high levels of society were able to make money as merchants, buying and selling goods and services. And so along with that sort of rise of the merchant class, you started to get a, 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 a bubble in the middle of society between the, the very rich and the very poor who had money and therefore money led to power. And with this rise of the merchant class, we see that sort of infiltrating politics and punishment and corrections and many things in society and education and how we thought about how to move forward um, as civilized human beings. So this filtered down into the correctional system. So this major shift led to um, that sort of re the re envisioning the idea that punishment should always fit the crime. Um, the only way for us to live as rational human beings um, is the idea that we need to be able to weigh the benefit of engaging in a certain behavior versus the cost of engaging in that behavior. So this idea of matching punishments with crime was huge. Um, the idea of penitentiaries, um, which is just an, in many ways another name for prisons. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. But for right now, a penitentiary is sort of the idea that people, and it, it's not just the facility, it's also sort of a philosophy too. So penitentiaries sort of are facilities to hold individuals who have been convicted of crimes, 
But that first part, the penitence, is at the beginning of that name is a big part because sort of the spirit of penitentiaries was the idea that individuals should be sort of held in isolation, to be alone with their thoughts, to think about the bad things they've done, and hopefully to sort of work through it so that they become a better person. Um, so maybe they would be they'd be given opportunities to read the Bible or other types of literature to help them sort of work through and sort of think about the bad things they've done. Um, penitentiaries were also known for hard work. We've heard that already. Um, the idea of, of having people sort of like, you know, the idea of like, hard work and labor will you know lead you in the right direction so we sort of sort of this this approach and it's still a philosophy that we've held on to to today so there was three major influencers i mean and obviously there's probably many more influencers but i think three that all of us should be well aware of are cesare beccaria Jeremy Bentham and John Howard. Um, all of these individuals lived during the 1700s. Uh, Beccaria was an Italian uh, man. Bentham and Howard were both British. Um, but all of them played their own unique and influential roles in this sort of this change in correctional practice and how we think about punishment um, and, and, and crimes and, and the appropriate type of punishment. So Beccaria, some of you may be familiar with, um, if you've ever taken a class that focused on criminological theory, is often referred to as sort of the father of the classical school of criminology. Um, and in its core was this belief that mankind and humankind are rational creatures. Um, and rational creatures will sort of live life in a way where they want to seek pleasure and seek benefit and avoid pain. And in order to have um, laws to govern society, assuming that humans sort of behave in that rational mindset, our laws should be very clear. That was one of the things he wrote about in On Crimes and Punishments in 1764. We should make it so that pretty much everyone in society who can even read or understand basic ideas um, proficiently should be able to understand the laws and understand what's okay and what is not okay. Um, and then the same thing goes into the types of punishments. The punishments should fit the crimes. Um, we should not have overly severe punishments for certain crimes because that's not going to stop somebody from engaging in even more um, severe type of criminal behavior. If they're going to receive a harsh punishment, so what? Then it's sort of like, you know, there's no limit to what they might do. Um, but also the punishment should be severe enough and certain enough that the person will think twice before engaging in criminal behavior. And the ideas laid out by Bakari in, in the book On Crimes and Punishment have stood the test of time and are still referred to and are a core piece of many of the laws we see, not just in the United States today, but around the world. Um, the second major influencer was Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy Bentham was an English gentleman, um, a great legal scholar of the time. And he, um, writing around the same time as Beccaria, in, in England, Bentham was positing many of the same ideas about the rational human being. Um, but he also sort of coined certain terms like the idea of the hedonistic calculus, um, which sort of flowed into his idea of utilitarianism. And utilitarianism was just his sort of English approach to what Beccari was saying, which was that we as humans we do this calculus, this mathematical approach in our mind every moment of every day where we live to seek out pleasure and we live to avoid pain. So as human beings, if we want to get the most pleasure, pleasure sometimes can, lead, can sort of involve taking things that aren't yours or harming other individuals just to get to your end game. But as long as we have the appropriate laws that can bring in the right amount of pain, should you violate those laws, then that will keep sort of a balance of humanity. So there's a balance between seeking out pleasure and avoiding pain. And then finally, I would argue um, one of my favorite of the three is John Howard. Um, and John Howard was sort of the, you know, he was the epitome of my mind of sort of this merchant class. He was a, the blue collar practitioner guy um, who found his way to end up being the sheriff of, I think it was called Bedfordshire, England. 
Um, and as his new role as sheriff, one of the things that was often neglected by many sheriffs of, of across many municipalities in England was the visiting of jails and prisons. Um, and many people would be appointed a sheriff as a, a fancy title, um, but would oftentimes sort of neglect their duties. Howard was not that type of individual. Howard actually, once being appointed sheriff, decided to start visiting the jails and the prisons in his area. Um, and what he found was disgust. Um, they were overcrowded. There was malnutrition. There was um, abuse. There were people not receiving medical care. And he found that that was not a message of a civilized society to be punishing people by basically making their condition even worse. Um, and so he started to tour. He toured throughout Europe and, and visited various facilities in Germany and France and other um, parts of Europe and came back and wrote a book called The State of Prisons in England and Wales describing sort of this contrast of the good versus the bad of various sort of correctional facilities, both in England as well as other parts of Western Europe. Um, and what he highlighted was the need for reform. Um, the need for simple changes such as, you know, making sure that there's adequate food and sort of um, shelter and things for, for inmates who are incarcerated. Um, the need for organization and structure, not just lock, locking up humans as if they're in some sort of like dog kennel um, where they have no purpose during the day. Have a structured routine where there's some amount of work or something to, get, to allow these individuals to pass the time. Um, and also an idea idea of making sure that when people are going to be housed in a jail or prison type setting, that there should be a recognition of sort of what is expected of these individuals, as well as what is the length of time that they plan to serve. And that should match sort of the crime. Um, once again, many things that have, have sort of held on and we've um, used um, from his sort of his ideas and his suggestions. And Many people credit him as being the father of the modern penitentiary, um, and he was one of the key people to push for the Penitentiary Act of 1779, um, which especially in England and Western Europe led to a lot of reform and change as far as how these var various um, institutions were run and how they were managed. And that's where we're going to wrap up for today. Obviously, I encourage you to read through those chapters that I mentioned earlier in your textbook because I think they add a little bit more. This was just sort of um, an overview of some of the major points I want to make sure you take away. And then in our next lecture, we will start to look at how many of these ideas sort of started to were introduced and led to the growth of the correctional system and our, our approach to punishment here in the United States. So that's it for today. Have a good one.